Good everybody. I'm Barbara Derrick, and I'm the Executive Director for Smoke Free SC. Thanks so much for joining our Tobacco Roundtables, Tobacco Partner Roundtable this month. We have these monthly, except for the months of May when we have our summit, and December for the holidays. So I'm going to turn it over to Tara now, and she's going to introduce our speakers. And again, thanks for joining us today. Good morning, everyone. Like Barbara said, thank you for joining us. We're excited to hear from our um, friends and partners in North Carolina and Mecklenburg County today. Um, at the end of the meeting, Beth Johnson from ACS CAN will hopefully be able to join us um, to give us a legislative update about what's happening in South Carolina. Um, as always, we record these meetings, so we will put the recorded version on our website and our YouTube channel next week. Um, we will have time for questions at the end. If you have questions during, feel free to pop those in the chat bar so you don't forget. Um, but we're excited to have Irene and Kimberly here this morning. I will pass it over to them and let them introduce themselves. Awesome. Thank you. Go ahead, Kim. I'll let you and then I'll pull up the screen. Okay. Um, and you all can call me Kim. Um, my email is Kimberly, but I go by Kim, and um, thank you for the invitation to join you all today. It's a pleasure to um, talk with our friends across the state line. Um, my name is Kim Thea, and I'm the Tobacco Prevention and Control Supervisor um, for our tobacco team at Mecklenburg County Public Health. Irene? And I'm Irene McCarthy. I'm the Tobacco Prevention Coordinator for the team. Can you guys see the screen? Are you guys able to see the screen? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Great. All right, Kim, just let me know when to change slides. Okay. Um, well, we were asked today to share just um, an overview of our program at Mecklenburg County Public Health, which, of course, you guys probably know is, is based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, so that's what we're going to do, just kind of give an overview of, of our program. Next slide. Um, this is our team. We, uh, myself, Irene, also Jasmine Simmons, our tobacco control coordinator, and Carleen Crawford, who is actually um, cover supports Mecklenburg and ten surrounding counties. So in North Carolina, um, the CDC tobacco control money that comes to the state, um, the the um, tobacco prevention and control branch funds a regional tobacco control manager for each of the 10 public health regions, and we are in region four. So Carlene is that state-funded position, and then Irene and Jasmine and myself are all locally funded. We're very fortunate that um, our Mecklenburg County government has dedicated dollars to those three locally funded positions. Next. Um, and we are located in public health within the Office of Chronic Disease Policy and Prevention. And this shows, um, this is a one pager, we call it, of our, our program. Um, and our motto, so to speak, is reducing chronic disease by making healthier choices easier. And we focus on three different areas, tobacco prevention and control, food security, and built environment and active living. Because as you know, those are the um, behaviors and the issues that underlie um, so many of the chronic diseases in our country. And we do our work with a, with a strong focus on policy systems and environmental change, as I'm sure a lot of you guys do as well. So with our um, tobacco prevention and control program, one of our key goals is to increase tobacco-free environments. We know that not only does that decrease exposure to secondhand smoke, it also decreases role modeling to youth um, to help prevent youth initiation of tobacco use and also helps those who are trying to quit. Um, and then, of course, the prevention arm, which Irene will talk a lot about, is that youth tobacco prevention. Next. Um, some of our goals, and uh, more specifically, reducing exposure to secondhand smoke and e-cigarette aerosol, which we've added to that um, statement of secondhand smoke, increasing tobacco-free environments, and this um, shows a picture of a sign that we have um, um, highlighting our tobacco-free park system. 
preventing youth and young adult initiation of tobacco use. And then of course, addressing those tobacco related health disparities underlies all of the work that we do. Next. So I encourage you to, um, it, it's always a work in progress, but I encourage you to visit our tobacco web pages on our public health website. If you um, put in your search tobaccofree.mecnc.gov, it should take you to our landing page for our tobacco prevention and control program. And then you will see, um, scroll down and you'll see some boxes of some additional initiatives, which we're gonna hit on today. Um, Change for Life Tobacco Free Recovery is our tobacco free behavioral health effort. Um, Quit Menthol Your Way is a new menthol tobacco campaign. Quitting Tobacco Use highlights our quit line and other key concepts. Um, as I mentioned, our Region 4 Tobacco-Free Alliance, that is our 11 county regional efforts where we partner with health departments in all of those counties, as well as other um, community partners. Um, a highlight on tobacco-free policy efforts and then youth tobacco prevention. Next. So I just wanted to hit on when we talk about tobacco free policy, these are some of the areas that we work in, which I'm sure are similar to the areas that South Carolina works in. Um, we in, in North Carolina, of course, we have to work within the legal authority that we have in terms of regulatory. So some of this work is from a regulatory <clears throat> standpoint, and then some of it is working with folks to um, voluntarily adopt tobacco-free policies. Um, in terms of local governments in North Carolina, we are able to um, work with our local boards of county commissioners to adopt um, tobacco-free board, board of health rules or county ordinances. Um, so working with municipalities as well as county boards. And um, we are able to adopt um, tobacco-free government buildings, vehicles, and property, um, in addition to smoke-free slash tobacco-free indoor public places. And public places is defined by any public or private business that allows the public indoors. So our goal would be to, to um, exercise that authority to the full um, extent that we can, and then working with other folks voluntarily, multi-unit housing with a focus on affordable housing, working with those colleges and universities. We do have preemption in North Carolina around our UNC public college system or university system. Um, the, the university system, can those campuses can be tobacco-free indoors and up to 100 feet of doorways. We hope to change that one day, but we do have quite a lot of progress um, with our community colleges as well as the private universities. And then behavioral health facilities, it's a huge emphasis right now on that disparity population. And we actually have a Medicaid requirement coming down um, April of next year that those behavioral health providers that accept Medicaid dollars must have a tobacco-free policy and a little bit more on that. So next, uh, I think the next one is just a slide showing some of the um, environmental supports for some of those tobacco-free environments. And our team works with all of these various um, entities, um, you know, workplaces, healthcare agencies, um, any, any, any public or private entity that reaches out to us interested in a tobacco-free policy, we would jump on that as, as a priority because that is an overarching um, best practice. Okay. So the other thing that we spend a lot of energy on is offering trainings in person and virtual. And these are just some of the topics um, of trainings that we have provided and um, ha have quite uh, an encyclopedia, so to speak, of PowerPoint slides and just constantly updating and tailoring those, those trainings to meet the needs of, of groups that we're working with. And we try to, especially um, those folks that, you know, we, we try to find that PSE hook in addition to um, just raising awareness around best practice tobacco issues. Okay. 
So I wanted to um, talk for a second about a big initiative, Change for Life Tobacco-Free Recovery. Um, and this is, again, you can go to our website and see more information. Um, this is um, an effort that started probably back, going back to 2016, when we committed to working with the behavioral health, um, really providers of within the behavioral health population to help um, train professionals on what is best practice tobacco treatment, how to integrate tobacco treatment into their facilities. And we're referring to, of course, mental health, um, substance use disorder treatment, as well as IDD. But we've done less with that IDD population, really more mental health and substance use disorder treatment facilities. Um, and, and really increasing awareness around the connection of being tobacco free and how that improves mental health, improves recovery and providing technical assistance to those agencies on how to adopt a tobacco free campus policy, how to integrate tobacco treatment and also motivational messaging. And we have, um, we um, as funds have allowed, we've partnered with a communications company that's helped us with some of that messaging and done focus groups and so forth. And we formed a regional coalition and um, that has been very successful. And um, I'll show you in just a minute an impact slide. The other thing is we, we heard loud and clear from those partner agencies that they really needed access to nicotine replacement therapy. And of course, um, that is a key component of Quitline NC, but we realized that they also needed um, to have NRT on hand, especially for those SUD residential programs. And so that's something that um, we have been involved in trying to increase access to NRT and doing lots of trainings, trainings, trainings. And that's how we've also networked and formed relationships with a lot of those behavioral health champions. Um, next. So this shows from January, 2020 to May, 2023, um, that the collective impact of the Change for Life Coalition work, we've had over 40 agencies involved, um, our, we were holding monthly coalition meetings and attendance would average about 30 per meeting and folks would come and go based on what their needs are, um, provided trainings to probably 2000 plus individuals in the state. And we partner very closely with um, our tobacco control network across the state and, and work very closely with um, our friends at the state level with the Tobacco Prevention and Control Branch. Steph Gans, some of you may know her name, is a, is a key state level person that's overseeing this work. Um, but to date, we've had 15 behavioral health agencies to adopt um, tobacco-free campus policies and integrate tobacco treatment, impacting um, close to 100,000 clients and staff. Okay. Uh, this just shows some of the, uh, we called these rack cards. Uh, we did develop some uh, messaging and educational materials for those agencies. We heard that they did not really have the capacity to do that. And so many of them are on tight budgets. And so we knew that that was um, part of the TA that we could provide. And all of these um, communication materials are on our website and you'll find if you go to um, click on it and download, it'll ask <clears throat> for your email because we do want to know who's using the materials and have the ability to follow up and provide more assistance. Next. Um, oh, this shows, and this is an area that Irene was very involved in. We learned from um, our um, from some partners at Second Harvest Food Bank, which is regional footprint in the Charlotte area, that they were receiving donated NRT from CVS and they were just throwing it away. And so we reached out and said, we want it. And so for about a year and a half, we were collecting that, repackaging it and giving it to our behavioral health partners involved in the coalition, but realized that, you know, that was not a sustainable system. And so reached out to, in North Carolina, we have, um, a statewide nonprofit called NC Medicist that provides um, medications 
prescription and over the counter to especially uninsured individuals. And so we reached out to them and set up a system where our behavioral health agencies could enter into an MOU and receive um, some NRT monthly as supplies allow. And we're working on um, really trying to increase um, sources for, for that NRT. Okay. And then um, moving on to a to highlight a communication campaign that we launched this year, Quit Menthol Your Way. Um, we had some um, CDC COVID health disparity funds that came to Mecklenburg County Public Health, and those funds were used in a variety of ways. One little piece of it was um, communications campaign in four different areas, one being menthol tobacco and really targeting the African-American community. And so this shows um, oh, it shows our CATS bus, bus system and some of the ads on the buses, but we also had, um, you know, we're, we're in the middle of that because it's a May to July media placement. Um, we have radio ads as well as um, some print ads ads at gas stations, posters in barber and braid shops, and digital ads. And so we're in the process of tracking the impact of that. And the call to action here, because we're not, our state is not in a position yet to um, advocate banning flavors, banning menthol um, at the local level, because we don't have that authority right now because of preemption in North Carolina around point of sale. So, so the call to action was really more driving, learning about the impact of menthol and driving folks to quit line and see. Um, and so uh, Irene will be sharing this with you. And I think these are active links that you can see some of those ads. And um, we did develop these with um, um, focus group input made a lot of changes after we had um, some focus group input. Quitting is the ultimate smoke break. And again, it has a QR code that takes you to our um, web page on our website. And also worked in conjunction with No Menthol Sunday, which of course is the third week of May every year. And, oh, let me just mention, we do have a goal. This is um, over, the next, um, this upcoming fiscal year, we really want to develop a um, multicultural tobacco control coalition to build capacity for addressing these, these issues, including advocacy at the state level around um, getting local control back. Okay. Quitting tobacco use. Um, we spend um, a lot of time in promoting quit line NC. Next. Um, we work with a lot of um, community partners that reach various populations. We have a faith-based initiative called Village Heartbeat. Um, we also are active at Charlotte Pride, and we're actually going to be doing this year an LGBTQ-focused um, campaign around quitting and, um, and the menthol campaign that we just showed you um, next. But uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that we have found that a great um, lever that we have is, as funds allow, providing scholarships to key individuals in the community to attend our Duke UNC Tobacco Treatment Specialist training. I understand South Carolina has a program now, too. And we um, are close partners, public health at the state level, and then um, some of us at the local and regional level also are involved in facilitating some of the breakout sessions when they have the courses. Um, just can't say enough about the impact that the Duke UNC TTS program has had on North Carolina. So we really do try to um, scholarship folks to go as well as our team have has all been trained in the TTS. Okay. Um, Promoting Quitline NC. Um, this is a new logo that they have. Um, and so, um, Irene, you can just kind of flip through these. Um, this is something that, you know, we, we know that the Quitline services vary um, per state. And so these are slides that talk about what our services promote. And we um, provide TA 
to um, agencies to get them to register as referral sites to the quit line and to really integrate that into their electronic health records. This is a piece that we recently developed to promote the quit line and we'll be providing um, packets to our frontline staff at um, the health department. And this is just a piece that we can use when we're out in the community um, talking about the quit line. Okay. Uh, Tobacco-free policies. Um, this shows you an overview in North Carolina where regulatory action has happened. So we've made a lot of progress to be a tobacco growing state, um, but we still have, have work to do. Next. Um, this shows you our Mecklenburg County tobacco regulation that's in place right now, a Board of Health rule that went into place in 2015. It was around smoke-free government grounds, and our goal is to update that to tobacco-free. Things have changed a lot since 2015. Um, we want to upgrade that to a gold standard, but we um, have had a lot of delays due to COVID and, and other issues, but that's one of our goals is to, to really... Um, upgrade that local regulation. Next. And working with um, GCAA, the Greater, um, Greater Charlotte Apartment Association, um, we developed a smoke-free multi-unit housing certification back in 2017 <clears throat> and worked with a lot of, um, did a lot of lunch and learns and um, and encouraged those apartment communities to to go smoke-free indoors. And um, it kind of went dormant during the pandemic, of course, and um, we are re-engaging and trying to um, get some more traction going again with smoke-free multi-unit housing and with a focus on affordable housing. And I think I mentioned already about colleges and universities. This shows you the ones that have gone 100% tobacco-free on their campuses, and then um, some that we're still working with um, to improve those tobacco-free policies. All right, so Irene, you take it away, and I guess at the end we'll um, have questions. Great, thanks, Kim. Um, so a little bit about our youth tobacco prevention. This is kind of primarily my role as a youth tobacco um, prevention coordinator in some work that we're doing here. Uh, so we do a lot of vaping and emerging tobacco product awareness trainings, events, social media communication tools. Um, one of the things that we did was back in 2021, our How to Talk to Youth About Vaping event. It was um, partnered with Livable Mech, which is another county program. And we did a virtual event through Facebook Live, um, basically geared towards adults and showing them how to communicate effectively with youth around the topic of vaping. Um, and through that, we had a few different youth focus groups. And um, we created what's called our 10 Tips for Effective Communication with Youth about Vaping brochure and infographic with the youth's input, which is really cool. So if you want access to that, that can be found on our website as well. Uh, we've also re-engaged with schools, um, particularly Charlotte Mecklenburg schools and also some charter schools um, to influence tobacco prevention and alternative to suspension curriculum. So we always wanna promote those evidence-based resources um, to the schools. We also collaborate with uh, youth partner organizations and other influencers outside of schools as well. Um, and we also work with our Mecklenburg County Public Information Team or our PI team to provide that comprehensive data-driven social media content as well. Um, our team specifically has cre um, created a lot of different communication tools and messages, one of them being our top five youth e-blasts that I send out every month via email, and it has five quick relevant pieces of um, information regarding tobacco related news that can be shared um, with the community. So if you do wanna be a part of that newsletter, let me know and I can um, add you to the listserv. We also had um, our first annual last year contest, our Youth Voices Tobacco Free video contest for middle school and high school youth um, in Mecklenburg and also the 11 surrounding um, health region four uh, counties as well. This year, we're also doing it again, but we're actually expanding. So it's not just going to be a video contest. It's also going to have a print category, which includes like logo contest, um, if they design something for a t-shirt, magnets, uh, photography, things like that. So really just expanding that expression. 
Um, and so we're so excited to do it again this year. So our goal really was to amplify those youth voices and involve them in that education awareness and advocacy opportunity to further promote tobacco-free environments. Um, and then here are some just key issues that we um, showed them, you know, they could talk about vapes, point of sale, queen tobacco, um, how it impacts the environment, and we provided some information for them. Uh, we did this through what's called Videos for Change. If you guys have heard about them, it's through High Resolves. It's a fantastic platform that we'll probably uh, use again this year. So it's a way for those students to register, submit their entries, and then we can also um, judge them afterwards and provide those prizes. These are just some of the partners we worked with on that initiative, and we plan on working um, with them and a, a few more this year as well. Uh, we're also working with Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools on this school-based virtual care initiative. Um, it is up and coming. We haven't done it quite yet. We do want to launch it in the fall. Um, so around 50 schools in CMS right now have school-based virtual care. Where our team would come in is that we would essentially add a new component to that SBVC initiative, um, which would be that youth tobacco treatment um, that they currently don't have. So we would want to essentially decrease and treat adolescent dependence on tobacco tobacco products, and we would provide that um, through tobacco use disorder assessment, counseling, medical treatment for nicotine dependence um, through the AAP. So the American Academy of Pediatrics has some protocols around treating uh, youth tobacco dependence, and so we would be using those protocols. Uh, so the partners would be us at MCPH and our public health school nurses, Atrium Health, and um, Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. So we will be working with one pilot high school and then hopefully expanding if it is uh, successful. These are just some um, of our youth tobacco prevention uh, documents and resources that we have on our website. Again, Kim mentioned there is a section if you click on youth um, on our tobaccofree.mecnc.gov website, you'll be able to pull up these resources. These are things that we created um, one pagers, uh, infographics, brochures, and then tobacco cessation links as well. This is another document that was created a few years ago and we continually update it. We actually just recently updated it about a week ago. Um, it is comprehensive, it is lengthy, I will warn you, but um, it does have a lot of great resources on educational programs, media campaigns, parent resources, prevention, alternative suspension, curriculum, et cetera. So if you want access to that, you can also find it on our website and it will um, link you to the state's website where you can pull it up and download it. Um, another thing I've been working on recently is with the health and PE specialists at Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools um, and updating their ATOD or alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs curriculum for all middle schools in CMS. Um, we That update is going to launch August of this year, so we're very excited. Um, and CMS uses what's called mind maps to facilitate discussions with their students and teach them the lessons. Um, and they currently did not have vaping related mind maps um, in their ATOD curriculum. So they asked um, us to create some new mind maps. And so I created two. One you'll see right here is the effects of vaping and e-cigarette use mind map. Um, ideally, these boxes will be blank. So it's like a cheat sheet for the teacher, but the boxes will be blank and it'll help um, facilitate discussion with the students on like, yeah, how does it affect our brain health? How do you think it affects our bodies? And, the, and so it kind of facilitates um, that conversation. The second mind map is on healthy coping strategies. And we know this is important because we um, were told 81% of youth who started using vapes said they started vaping to decrease their stress, anxiety, and depression. So that mental health piece is huge and it's something that needs to be talked about. Um, and so that's what this mind map specifically tackles. So asking them, yeah, what are the reasons behind that stress and anxiety that you're facing? What are some signs and symptoms? And then what are some healthy ways to handle it? Um, because again, a lot of them are using vapes to, to handle their stress and their anxiety. And so once you take away that coping mechanism, they're still left with the stress and anxiety and now they don't know how to deal with it. And so we need to have the discussion on what are some healthy ways um, to handle that. Um, along with these two mind maps, I created um, a teacher guide as well. So that is a lot of good information, data points on just tobacco use and vaping in general that could help the teacher facilitate discussion. And there's also some key questions uh, for youth to ponder. So some key questions 
sample questions, if you will, for the teacher um, to kind of spark that discussion. And then lastly, I also created what's called a supplemental toolkit for the teachers, um, which links evidence-based and evidence-informed videos, activities, and resources that they could utilize in the classroom um, just as supplemental information. So that was some of our youth um, work. Now moving on to the advocacy piece, which is our last piece of the presentation, um, and talking about protecting our kids from vaping and nicotine addiction by establishing a retailer permitting system or um, tobacco retail licensure system, or TRL, as many people know it from, and then also raising the minimum age from 18 to 21, which we know federally it has been done, but now a lot of states, I want to say a lot, but nine more need to go ahead and align to that, um, to that federal law. Why is that important? We know that 95% of all tobacco users start before the age of 21, which is an insane amount. Um, and a lot of that is due to a lot of that marketing and targeting from the tobacco industry at a young age. We know that, that the tobacco industry spends a million dollars an hour on that point of sale advertising, price promotions, um, all those discounts, right? And so it's important to try and address that piece. You'll see this data. Um, is North Carolina data and where young people primarily get their e-cigarettes from. You'll see almost a little over 59% of youth under the age of 21 get it from a retailer. So gas station, grocery store, mall, shopping center, et cetera. Um, so you might be asking, well, why? I thought you, they have to be 21. Well, again, North Carolina has not aligned quite yet. So they could not be accounting for those 18, 19, 20 year olds. Or secondly, you know, if they are using fake IDs, or, you know, the clerks aren't, you know, IDing. So there are some other reasons um, behind that as well. Uh, so North Carolina still needs to raise its minimum age to purchase uh, 221. Again, that's important because young people transition from experimental use to regular use between those um, important ages of 18 to 21. And also just because it's confusing, right? It's confusing to retailers and consumers to have separate ages to follow for state and federal law. So they really do need to be in sync. Um, this map shows uh, the states that have implemented T21 and those that have not kind of implemented and aligned with the federal T21. There's about nine that haven't, including North Carolina. Um, why? North Carolina is trying to do it right. So there are a few provisions within their T21 law that they really want to update and strengthen. That way it's an effective T21 law. Um, there's another map that I don't have access to, but it shows the different grades um, that these states that have T21 were granted. So some states got like a C, got an F in their T21 law because they literally just crossed off 18, put 21, and didn't make any other changes. So it was actually not as effective. Um, and so we really are trying to do it right because there are some provisions in there, like rolling back preemption, establishing a TRL. Um, and then this one right here is a big one that we're trying to change because currently um, this is in the criminal code and it really needs to be in the civil code. So currently we can criminalize um, and penalize clerks for selling to underage persons and also youth for buying tobacco products. So we do not want to criminalize um, people for this, right? This really needs to move from the criminal statute into the civil, civil code. And so that's one of the provisions that we are updating. So an effective law to raise tobacco to age 21 would um, include all these different things. So it would apply to all tobacco products. It would require a retailer permit. And that is huge because currently, we don't know what's popping up out there. All these new tobacco vape shops and stuff like that don't actually have a license to sell like, you know, other alcohol um, stores do to sell alcohol. Like they don't have that kind of permitting system quite yet. And so we don't know what's all out there. We don't have a comprehensive list. And so it makes it really difficult for us to track and see what's going on and what's getting sold. Um, so we really want an effective law to require retailer permitting, um, require ID checks, impose minimal penalties for purchasers under 21, so not criminal, but civil, um, hold retailers responsible for violations, require signage. And then we really do wanna require um, that employee training and enough time to educate retailers. We don't wanna just put it out there and say, okay, here it is, follow it. You know, people are gonna have questions. There's gonna be like miscommunication. So we really want time um, to educate as well. And we also want to allow local government authority, which is really tough because, again, we're under preemption. And so um, 
we would make a huge dent, you know, if we were able to go ahead and have that local government authority. And so that's one of the provisions we're trying to do is roll back preemption. It's going to be a hard sell. We don't we don't think it might pass, but um, we're hopeful. We'll see. We'll see. Um, we also have what's called the federal SINAR amendment. So federal law known as the SINAR amendment now requires states to annually inspect a random sample of tobacco retailers to determine what percentage is selling to youth under the age of 21. So if our underage sales go above 20%, which North Carolina is pretty close, I don't remember exactly, Kim, I think it's between 17 and 19%. Um, so the state may be forced to forfeit millions of federal substance abuse prevention and treatment block grant monies that fund prevention, treatment, and recovery initiatives. So we really do not want to go above that 20%. Um, so that's kind of sounded the alarm to like, hey, we really need to focus on reducing sales to youth and TRL can really help. So again, um, having TRL or tobacco retailing permitting system um, allows the state to know where these products are being sold, allows the state to inspect for responsible retail practices, provides a more effective mechanism for enforcing the law and provides a funding mechanism as well. Um, if anyone wants to learn more, I found these really two great fact sheets. One, from, one is from the American Heart Association and then the other one is from SYNC on just why TRL is important and how it could help prevent the sale of underage um, teeth. Um, we've also been partnering with Counter Tools on an initiative. So there is some money that was funneled down from the state to Mecklenburg and two other rural counties in North Carolina um, to assist North Carolina in T21 TRL advocacy by assessing the tobacco retail environment, collecting meaningful data and stories. Um, and so our efforts will help, you know, again, raise that minimum age from 18 to 21, establish the TRL, and hopefully roll back that preemp preemption. Um, so we're doing a lot of uh, storytelling, communication tools. Um, there's a data dashboard that was created. And we also will have an intern who will help create some of those infographics as well. Um, but we essentially went out to, what was it, Kim, like 112 um, really, it was like 179, but some of them, again, we don't have a comprehensive list um, of these tobacco retailers. So we went with what we did have um, to go out there and basically collect this data of, you know, what are they selling? Um, is it near within a thousand feet of schools? Um, how many menthol products? What is the price between um, retailers in low income areas versus high income areas? Uh, so a lot of good data collection from this that we're excited to share. Uh, and here's the dashboard to give you an idea, just one page from the dashboard um, that Counter Tools created for us. So those were the assessments we did, all the different counties that participated, uh, the type of retailer, um, and a bunch of other questions and snapshots that we had as well. And it was, we used the STARS assessment. Yes, and, thank you. Yes, and it was a total of 228 stores in Mecklenburg and those surrounding counties. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that really is it. So I tried to talk fast. Hopefully I didn't go over too much. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any other questions or comments, we'd be happy to take it at this time if, if we have time. So. Yeah, we definitely have time. That was fabulous. Irene and Kim, thank you so much. Y'all do the great work in your county. Thank you. So any questions? I Irene, mean, was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot, but that's exciting that you're doing so much. Um, I have a question. Um mm -hmm. The slide you shared about the supplemental materials you provide to teachers, um, how, so this is just, you know, going back to that relationship you have with the schools, mm -hmm. do they reach out to y'all? Do you reach out to them? Um, how does that relationship work with your schools? A little bit of both. So mm -hmm. when I first started, and Kim can talk about a little bit history before that, but when I started, I kind of, um, mostly went on to a lot of the charter schools. I think they were a bit more responsive at the time um, as, you know, COVID was, you know, schools were getting back in session. And so the charter schools were a bit more responsive. So I started working with them. Um, and then once we got some good new champions, I think in some of the CMS schools, that's kind of when it really started getting revitalized. So the new health and PE specialist um, at CMS was a really great champion and advocate for this work. And so she reached out to us on the vaping mind maps, which, 
it's always a win when they reach out to you um, and you don't have to reach out to them. So. But um, the health and PE curriculum coordinator or specialist at the, at the system level has always been, um, there's a new person who, who's an awesome champion, but before that, you know, historically that has been the, the person kind of our go-to person um, that oversees health and PE teachers. Um, but also we have um, student assistance program or SAP counselors through the um, um, mental health program. And so for the treatment arm, and um, so really, as, as Irene said, it's a little bit of both. They reach out to us. We reach out to them. Um, but when we reach out to them, probably that health and PE route has been the traditional route. And um, we often try to get on the agenda for the back to school professional development days. That, that's one way to um, have a presence. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. So do y'all um, do... I guess it just depends on what the needs are. Do you ever present in the schools or is it more of just sending those supplemental and those mind map activities to the teachers? Yeah, we definitely present to the schools. And I mean, there's only four of us, so we don't have the capacity to go into every single school and present. Um, so we try to, when we do present, we also try and bring up the conversation of, hey, like, have you considered prevention and alternative suspension curriculum just because that is, we always want to think at that system level. Like we could reach 30 kids in a classroom, which is fantastic. Um, and it's still a win. Or we can also reach, you know, I won't say or, and you can also reach, you know, an entire school if if you have some kind of alternative suspension or prevention curriculum in place too. So we, we try to do both. Um, I always love when they ask me to come in because I get to actually directly like talk to the youth, see what's going on. They'll, they're will they really candid and open about what's happening and what they're seeing. Um, so it helps me as well just kind of understand what's really happening in the schools. Um, but yeah, we, we try to do a little bit of both. And the other thing to note is that um, we try to support as we can youth empowerment. Um, peer-led youth empowerment efforts. We have tried to actually host um, a youth council ourselves and realized that that, that doesn't really work, but, you know, public health being the host of that and that we really are better partnering with um, through, through technical assistance, time or dollars to support those partners who are already working with youth. And so that that's our approach now um, and, and, and need to do more of that. Um, that peer-led youth in engagement efforts. And so hopefully in the future can do more of that, but that takes a lot of time and energy and resources. So yes, definitely. Those are conversations we've had too about that youth yeah. council. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Great. A um, uh, question in the chat bar. Have you ever worked with HOSA? Uh, HOSA. HOSA. Yes, um, we have in the past. That's a great, that health occupations um, classes, that th those are great. Um, that's a great alignment and, and host is a great um, program and, and could engage them in um, potential advocacy projects. So. I think Karen, you had a question earlier. You went off mute for a second. Yes. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask kind of a similar question to what Tara asked, but more about the elected officials. Like, can you describe your relationship with your county council members and like how you keep them informed of what you're doing and and how to keep them um, maybe engaged? You know, because some of this stuff that gets passed, they might just feel like, okay, now we're done with mm -hmm. that. But, you know, how do you make them understand that it's just an ongoing challenge and you have to always attack it from lots of different ways? That, that's a really great question and really um, important need. And, and for us, of course, um, we have to follow the, um, the right protocol, the right channels. And we, in terms of um, Irene and I and our tobacco team staff, we do not reach out directly to elected officials, but we go through um, our population health assistant, um, health director, um, and our and our health director, we also have a um, legislative lia liaison staff person who works for the county. 
Um, and so we go through our public health leadership. And so we make sure that we really advocate. Um, sometimes I feel like we're the little gnat in their ear. <laughs> we keep bringing, you know, putting on the table our issues that are so important and advocating for the things that, that we feel are best through our public health leadership and make sure that they thoroughly understand so they can represent that with um with county leadership and then those elected officials. And then when, um, and then they bring us in when opportunities arise. Like we have a health and human services committee of the BOCC and we've made presentations to that group, but we first have to go through those, those um, leadership channels and um, wish we could do more. So many competing priorities, right? Um, but but really trying to strategically think about when you can bring up tobacco related issues um, and and tie them into other issues. Um, so those are some initial thoughts. Hello, my um, everyone. I'm Evita Woods. I'm a therapist here in the state of South Carolina and. I'm very interested in the portion that you have with the school system. I did my first 13 years in the local school systems here and learning that mental health has a huge piece and a huge link to tobacco use. Um, I'm like Tara, I'm very interested in the resources that you have for the teachers as well as your mind map. So if I could get a copy of that, I would love that um, to even work with my kids that I work in for therapy services. But my question is with, with the schools now here in South Carolina, most of them try, are trying to bring mental health um counselors on into the school systems to have their someone there on a 24-hour basis for this the, the um, teachers as well as the students would you think that is another resource or another um inlet and to be able to reach or to produce more awareness of the the connection between mental health and back tobacco use kim do you want to answer that one and then I can. well i i would just say um Absolutely. And, and one of the things that um, I recommend, and this is an approach that we often take, is asking to um, have conversations with them and, and hold an awareness training with those professionals. Um, Irene? Would you yeah. Add? And looping in admin, I think having those top dogs that make the decisions at the school um, mm -hmm. inform. That way you have their support and advocacy and that way it can kind of trickle down and say, hey, like we were informed this is a big issue and that way they can. That's one of the biggest things too when I was talking to teachers is like sometimes we don't have the principal support or the admin support. And so when you have like that top leadership support, I think it makes it easier on the teachers as well um, because they know they're on board. And another thing that we have um, in North Carolina, we call it our SHAC um, School Health Advisory Committee. And um, that Irene is an active member of that committee. And that's one way that she networks with various people who are um, within the school system. And so making sure, like she recently did a um, um, presentation on the T21 and TRL to the SHAC committee. And to so try and give a letter of support yeah. from them on the right. Theater. Do you guys have a shack? I, is that? Do you have that set up? The school is, advisory council is Mecklenburg. I guess it just depends on what part of the state we're in. Uh, is Mecklenburg just one um, school district, like all the counties, one district, or do you have multiple districts? We just had CMS is a huge system, which, okay. which it, th therein is a challenge <laughs> in and of yeah. itself, how huge of a system it is. Um, it's the main, um, okay. yeah, one giant one. <laughs> um, I know I've, I've also worked in rural communities and you, it, it, it's easier to get things done when you're working with smaller school systems. But yes, we have one big school system, but we also have a fair number of um, charter schools as Irene mentioned, and in private schools, but CMS is our is our only public school system in Mecklenburg County. Okay, I'm not sure for the rest of the state. I know um, I live in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and we have seven school districts within our county. Whoa. And, mm, yeah, wow. and each wow. school district has you know their own board and their own committees, and I know they wow. have boards related to um, like reproductive health and 
Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if those boards handle health like as an umbrella or if they're just very specific committees. I should probably research that. That would be a good committee to present to. I believe there is like a statewide um, mandate that each district has one or well, each school, I think. But from my experience, what I've been told is some are, you know, more active than others. Right. <laughs> some are, That's they're typical. kind of just mm -hmm. checking a box. Yeah. 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 I think it does help to have that kind of counsel together too, because then you have different entities from the school that can help support and advocate issues and bring it up. Definitely. Another another body that we have recently been um, more active with is um, school resource officers, and in fact, we're we're going to have a uh, at the state level, and then and then us locals are going to assist um, at the statewide SRO conference coming up. And, and those um, school resource officers are very interested in talking mm -hmm. about the vaping issue. And so that's another ally uh, to think about. Yeah. And again, we have resources on our website. So feel free to, you know, go on there and help grab some and help guide the conversation. Because I think it really is education and awareness. A lot of people don't realize, you know, how nicotine affects the brain and mentally, right? It's just like all oh, these physical effects of withdrawal and stuff, but it's like, it, it does make stress worse and anxiety worse, and it is impacting those kids. Um, and really that first piece is that education and awareness. And once you have that kind of those tools, it makes it easier to guide that conversation of, okay, well, now what do we do? What are some evidence-based resources to help address this? Um, and then connecting with the right people. So I having see. champions. Oh. I'm sorry. I was going to say we had a question pop up in the chat. Yeah, I was I was just reading that, Michael. I can address that. Um, so in North Carolina, we do not have the authority at the county level. I know that's we differ from South Carolina in that respect. We do not have the authority at the county level to do anything around point of sale. We have preemption around point of sale. And so we are all banning together across the state to um, support raising the age to 21, as well as um, implementing a TRL system, which we don't have, um, and rolling back preemption. Um, and so we're, we have been gathering letters of support in, in every corner that we can. And we anticipate, um, fingers crossed, that in legislative season 2024. So, you know, March, April 2024, a bill will be introduced in North Carolina, um, as as Irene explained earlier, addressing these things comprehensively. And so we are, between now and then, really um, raising awareness and building support for that, raising the advocacy um, voices. And wanting to find some responsible tobacco retailers to to raise their voice, and and uh, through our work with Counter Tools, Michael, um, helping to you know show that local data because we did not previously have that. Right. Um, Beth Johnson is unable to join us. Um, so, and does anyone have another question before we hit our one hour mark? Okay. I would like to ask just one thing of everyone, um, if you don't mind just putting your name and um, your organization you represent in the chat bar. We had a lot of new names pop up in this meeting, and I would, um, you know, just love to be aware of who attended and who's involved in these conversations that we're having. So if you wouldn't mind, just again, put your name and your organization in the chat for me. That would be great. Um, Kim, Irene, thank you so much for attending today and sharing um, your organization and what y'all do within, within the county of Mecklenburg. Um, like we've said, it was a lot. It's really impressive that y'all are able to do um, that much work within your county. Um, it's exciting. We hope your legislative season goes well next year. Um, thank you again for joining us. This is recorded, so we will post it to our website and our YouTube channel next week. So if you want to go back and watch it, if you'd like to share it with anyone, you can definitely do that. Awesome. Thanks so much for having us. It was good seeing everyone again. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.